Hello everybody, this is Professor Vishal Gupta at the USC Marshall School of Business. This video is for BUAD 425, Data Analysis for Decision Making. So this is the last in a series of videos I'm going to make talking about the Trojan Horse Lab and case. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to use logistic regression to fit a model for the Trojan Horse data. So in previous videos, I've already discussed what each of the columns mean and why we've excluded 1,000 of the entries for the test set. So I'm going to get directly into fitting the model. So to fit the model, I'm going to go here to Analyze, Fit Model. And just like for decision trees, I'm going to tell Jump that I'd like it to predict success. And I'd like it to use these variables to create the prediction. I'll make sure the personality is set to nominal logistic. And then I hit Run. Now Jump goes off and produces a bunch of output. Now, as I mentioned in class, if this was a statistics course, I would teach you what all of these numbers mean, how to compute them, and how to interpret them. But since this is a business analytics course, I just want to focus on the few numbers that I think are most useful in practice to look at and think about. So the first one I want to point out is here, the R squared of the model. In this case, the R squared of this model is about 18%. Now, R squared for logistic regression means something slightly different than R squared does for ordinary regression. In particular, for ordinary regression or for decision trees, the R squared is a measure of the percentage of the variability in the data set that's explained by the model. In logistic regression, the R square is the percentage of the likelihood that's explained by the model. Now these two things are pretty similar. They both go between zero and 100%. 100% is great. 0% is pretty bad. It's not really clear what's big enough or what is a good model. And I don't want to dwell too long on what the differences are here because they're a little subtle and of a statistical nature. What I do want you to know is that it's not really obvious whether or not I can compare this 18% to the R square of a different, say, decision tree model and say that one is better or worse, even though a lot of people tend to do this in practice. I would suggest instead, if you're trying to compare this logistic regression model to a decision tree model, you focus on more tangible business items like the expected profit or the confusion matrices directly. All right, so that was the first thing I wanted to point out. The second thing is that if we scroll down on this fit, we see the actual fitted values for each of the co for each of the variables in the model. So now jump tends to use the word estimate. Some people like to use the word coefficient. And in my class, I've been using the word weight. But all three of these things mean the same thing. I, these are the numbers that we would multiply each of these variables by in the logistic regression equation. So for example, for this model, the logistic regression equation would be something like the log odds or the score is minus 1.10 minus 0 0.0835 times the gender plus 0 0.001 times m minus 0 0.105 times r etc looking at these estimates we can start making some interpretations about the model so for example the coefficient or the weight or estimate here for gender is negative minus 0.835 and if we remember from the case a gender is one if the customer is female. So this is saying that because it's negative, women are less likely to buy the box. And this makes a lot of sense since Trojan Horse sells men's clothing. At the same time, I can look at something like, let's say, R, the recency, which is also negative. And what this is telling me is that customers who haven't purchased recently, i.e. it's been a long time since they made a purchase, are less likely to buy this box. And again, that's pretty intuitive. If they haven't been interacting with my service, they probably don't like it and probably aren't going to buy this box either. So these are each of the estimates for each of the variables in the model. The last thing I wanted to point out was the p-value. So the p-value here means something very similar to what it does in ordinary linear regression. So for example, let's consider the gender p-value. The way I interpret this is, suppose we lived in a world where gender actually had nothing to do with predicting whether or not a customer bought the box. If we were in that world, we would see a data set like the one that we currently have with probability 0.0003. I, it's very, very unlikely we would see such a data set. That's strong evidence to suggest that gender actually does have something to do with whether or not somebody buys a box. On the other hand, if I think about something like, let's say, the first purchase date, 
The p-value for the first purchase date is big. It's something like 50%. That means even if first purchase had nothing to do with whether or not someone would buy the box, I would see a data set like this 50% of the time. I, it's not really clear to me that first purchase is relevant to predicting whether or not someone buys a box. So these are the three things I wanted to point out. Again, the R square, the estimates for each of the variables, and the corresponding logistic regression equation, and the p-values. At this point, you can ask, well, is this a good model? And one criticism that you could make is that this model includes a lot of variables in it, so it's pretty complicated. There's something like 16 variables. And a lot of those variables, it's not even clear that they have anything to do with predicting whether or not someone buys a box. So for example, M has a very large p-value, first purchase has a very large p-value, etc. So a better model might be one that includes fewer variables, all of which are sort of have good strong statistical evidence that they help predict whether or not someone buys a box. How could we build such a model? Well, one idea would be, let me go rebuild the same logistic regression equation model well, let's say throw out the value of casual, so I don't include casual when I specify the variables, since it's unlikely that casual has anything to do with predicting a box. Recompute all the estimates and all the new p-values, and then pick another variable to throw out, and keep on throwing out variables until I get only variables that have significant p-values. But that feels really manual and difficult. Thankfully, Jump automates that process for you, so let me show you how to do that in Jump. I'm again going to go to Analyze, Fit Model. I'm going to specify, just like I did before, that I'd like to predict success, that I'd like to use all of these variables to do so. But now I'm going to change the personality from nominal logistic to stepwise. I hit Run, and Jump produces this window. So let's talk a little bit about this window. So, so far, Jump is saying, let's consider a logistic regression with no variables in it. You can see none of the variables are checked. They all have estimates of zero. If I were to hit go, jump is going to proceed in the forward direction, i.e. it's going to start adding variables one by one. And each time it's going to add a variable that it thinks is most likely to be helpful in predicting whether or not a customer buys the box. And it's going to only add those variables that are significant in a statistical sense. So if I hit go, jump goes through and decides that if I wanted to use the smallest number of variables to predict who is gonna buy a box, I should use six variables, and they should be the gender, the recency, the hipster, the classic gentleman, and the rugged. Now you can ask, how did Jump decide this? And there's some mathematics about this involving something called the Bayesian Information Criterion. We're not gonna get into the details of this in this class. If you'd like to know about it, come find me in office hours, and I'll be happy to explain it to you. What I do want you to know is that this is a proposal from Jump. Jump thinks that these six variables are best, but Jump doesn't know anything about the business. So you might look at this and knowing something about the business say, hey, Jump didn't include, for example, the monetary money spent, and that's actually very relevant to the business, so I would like to force it to use this, and you can do so. And you can force Jump to add this variable to the model. Or you might say, I don't think gender should have anything to do with whether someone buys a box, and you can force Trump to remove gender from a model by clicking on it. Generally speaking, if you're disagreeing with Jump's recommendations, you should have a really good reason to. And in this particular case, I don't have a really great reason to disagree with what Jump proposes, so I'm going to accept its proposal by clicking Make Model. And now you see Jump brings up the same logistic regression window we used to have, predicting success, but only includes the six variables that it decided were important. I'm going to hit Run. Jump produces this window, and this window looks exactly like the nominal logistic window that I had before. But you can see, whereas this one had these 16 variables towards the bottom, now I only have six variables with their corresponding estimates. And if I look at the p-values for my six variables, I can see that they're all very small. Now, one last thing I will mention, as you write, remember from 310, any regression that has more variables is going to have a higher R squared. So in this case, there are 16 variables on this side, and the R squared is something like 18%, whereas here there's only five variables, and the R squared is about 16%.
So the question isn't about which model has a higher R squared, since the more variables will always have a higher R squared, but it's whether the increase in the R squared is worth the extra complexity of having more variables. So in this case, we went from having something like 16 variables to having something like six variables. That's almost a third, uh, sorry, almost two thirds fewer variables. And we're only giving up maybe a percentage and a half in R squared. To me, that seems like a great trade-off. So I would prefer the smaller, simpler model. All right, as the last thing I want to do, I want to show how we can save this down and make some predictions about our model. Because remember, all of this was so far built with the training set, and I want to do some predictions with the test set. To do that, I'm going to click the right arrow here next to the model that I wanted to save down and go to Save Probability Formula. Once I do that, I can check on my jump spreadsheet and see that it's added several columns. What do these columns mean? Well, this first one, Lin1, is what we've been calling the score in class. This second one, probability one, is the probability that success is one. And remember, a success of one means that uh, the customer bought the box. So this is the probability that the customer would buy a box. This is one minus that probability. And just like I said before in the decision tree portion of the case, most likely success is what jump predicts. And jump makes this prediction by just checking whether or not this probability is bigger than 50%. In general, for most business analytics applications, that's not a very good way to make a prediction. We probably want a threshold different than 50%. And indeed, in this case, we're going to use a threshold of, uh, I believe, 15%. So I want to save this down to Excel. How do I do that? This is slightly different on Mac and on Windows. On Mac, I'm going to go to File, Export, save this to Excel by choosing the Excel box here, pick a place to put it, and if I was using Windows, I would go to File, Save As, and under here in the Save As menu, you'd be able to change the file type from JMP to Excel Workbook. All right, now I can fire up Excel. I can open the file I just saved down. And you'll see that I have my original data set all the way across plus the few extra columns that were labeled here. The last thing I'll do is I'll add my own prediction. Let me label it logistic regression prediction so I remember what it is. The case suggests using a threshold of 0.15. So to make my predictions, I'll simply go through and I'll check whether or not the probability that the model predicts someone will buy is greater than 0.15. If it is, I predict they'll buy. Otherwise, I'll predict they'll return. I can extend this all the way down, and now I have predictions for everyone in the training and test set. If you check my other video, you'll see how to then use this to create a confusion matrix for logistic regression using just the test set. All right, that's all there is to fitting logistic regression to the Trojan Horse data set. If you have any questions, please come and find me and I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks and good luck.